I bring you greetings. Today we start the book of Titus. Paul wrote this letter to his uh, apprentice, Titus. And it's good for us as we read to understand this letter. First, let me start with the Bible project who gives an overview of the letter of Titus. Paul's letter to Titus. Titus was a Greek follower of Jesus who was for years a trusted co-worker and traveling companion of Paul's. He had helped Paul in a number of crisis situations in the past, and in this letter we discover that Paul had assigned him the task of going to Crete, a large island off the coast of Greece, to restore order to a network of house churches. Now, Cretan culture was notorious in the ancient world. One of the Greek words for being a liar was kretidzo, to be a Cretan. These people were infamous for treachery and greed. Most of the men on the island had served as mercenary soldiers to the highest bidder, and the island cities were known known as being unsafe, plagued by violence and sexual corruption. However, the island of Crete had many strategic harbors and they serviced cities all over the ancient Mediterranean Sea. And so from Paul's point of view, Crete was the perfect place to start a network of churches. Now we don't know the details, but somehow these churches came under the influence of corrupt Cretan leaders. They said they were Christians, but they were ruining the churches. And so Paul assigned Titus with the task of going there to set things straight, and this letter provided the instructions. It has a pretty straightforward design. After a brief introduction, Paul gives Titus clear instructions about his tasks in the church. He then offers guidance about the new kind of household and then about the new kind of humanity that the gospel could create in these Cretan communities. Paul then closes the letter with some final greetings. So Paul opens the whole thing by reminding Titus that his message as an apostle is about the hope of eternal life, that is, the life of the new creation that is available starting now through Jesus the Messiah. And this hope was promised long ago by the God who does not lie. Now, this little opening comment introduces an important theme underlying the whole letter. One of the problems in the Cretan churches was that they had assimilated their ideas about Jesus, the Christian God, to their ideas about the Greek gods that they grew up with, specifically Zeus, their chief god. Cretan people claimed that Zeus was actually born on their island, and they loved to tell stories and mythologies about Zeus's underhanded character. He would seduce women and lie to get his way. And Paul wants to be really clear. The God revealed through Jesus is totally different than Zeus. His basic character traits are faithfulness and truth, which means the Christian way of life will be about truth also, which will be a real change for these Cretans. So Paul then addresses Titus with a twofold task. He says the first one is to appoint new leaders for each church community, a team of what he calls elders, mature husbands or fathers whose way of life is totally different from Cretan culture. They are to be known for integrity, total devotion to Jesus, for self-control and generosity, both in their families and in the community at large. And these new leaders are to teach the good news about Jesus and replace the corrupt leaders who need to be confronted. That's Titus's second task. Paul identifies the teachers as those of the circumcision. In other words, they were ethnically Jewish Cretans who said that they followed Jesus, but similar to the problems in Galatia, these people demanded that non-Jewish Christians be circumcised and follow the laws of the Torah if they really wanted to become followers of the Jewish Messiah. Paul says that they're obsessed with Jewish myths and human commands. And to top it off, they're just in the church leadership business to make money. And so Paul, in a brilliant move, he pulls a quote from an ancient Cretan poet, Epimenides, who was very frank and honest about the character of his own people. He said Cretans are always liars, vicious beasts, and lazy gluttons. They blur the lines between true and false, between good and evil, and they're just in it for the money. And so while these leaders claim to know God, their Cretan way of life denies him. They have to be dealt with. And this leads Paul into the next section. Because of these corrupt leaders, many Christians in these churches now have homes and personal lives that are a total wreck. And three different times, Paul highlights the result of all this. The message about Jesus is discredited. Their non-Christian neighbors now have good cause to make evil accusations. And all of this makes the teaching about God our Savior totally unattractive and not compelling to anybody. So Paul paints a picture of the ideal Cretan household that is devoted to Jesus. 
It would be elderly men and women who are full of integrity and self-control, so they can become models of character to the young people. And the young women shouldn't be sleeping around and avoiding marriage, as was fashionable on Crete at the time, but rather they should be looking for faithful partners so they can raise stable, healthy families. And the young men are to do the same. They're to be known as productive, healthy citizens. Christian slaves on Crete were in a unique position because we know that because of the gospel, they were treated as equals in Paul's church communities. However, there was a danger that they would use that equality as license to disrespect their masters and then become associated with slave rebellions, which would further discredit the Christian message. You can see Paul negotiating a fine line here. He believes that the gospel about Jesus needs to prove its redemptive power in the public square if it's really going to transform Cretan culture. And that's not going to happen through social upheaval or by Christians cloistering away from urban life. The Christian message will be compelling to Cretans when Christians fully participate in public life, when their lives and homes look similar on the surface. Because after a closer look, their neighbors will discover that Christians live by a totally different value system system out of devotion to a totally different God. And that's the difference that Paul beautifully summarizes at the end of chapter 2. He says the value system driving the Christian way of life is God's generous grace, which appeared in the person of Jesus and will appear again at his return. This grace was demonstrated when Jesus gave up his honor to die a shameful death on behalf of his enemies so that he could rescue and redeem them. And it's that same grace that calls God's people to say no to corrupt ways of life that are inconsistent with the generous love of God. Paul then zooms out from the Christian household to a vision of Christians living like new humans in Cretan society. Of all people, Christians should be known as the ideal citizens, peaceable, generous, obedient to authorities, known for pursuing the common good. But this is really different from how Cretans grew up. How are Christians supposed to sustain this countercultural way of life? And Paul believes the power source is the transforming love of the three-in-one God announced in the gospel. And he explores this with a really beautiful poem. He says, God's kindness and love are what saved us, despite ourselves, so that through the Holy Spirit, God washed and rebirthed and renewed people and through Jesus has provided a way for people to be declared right before him. And all of this opens up eternal life, that is, a new future in the new creation. This living story is so powerful, it can produce new kinds of people. Paul's convinced that spirit-empowered faithfulness to the teachings of Jesus will declare God's grace all over the island of Crete and all over the world. Paul concludes by promising to send backup for Titus, either Artemis or Tychicus, and then he says hello to their common friends. And so the letter ends. The letter of Titus shows us Paul's missionary strategy for churches to become agents of transformation within their communities. It won't happen by waging a culture war or by assimilating to the Cretan way of life. Rather, he calls these Christians to wisely participate in Cretan culture. They need to reject what's corrupt, but also embrace what's good there. If they can learn to live peaceably and devote themselves to Jesus and to the common good, Christians will, in his words, show the beauty of the message about our saving God. And that's what the letter to Titus is all about. Paul is the author of this letter to Titus and identified himself as a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ. For the faith of God's elect, and knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, a faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. So Paul lays it very, out, uh, very much early part that God has promised his people, God's elect, this whole area of eternal life, right from the beginning, that's part of God's plan. Verse 3 says, At his appointed season, he brought his word to light through the preaching and trusted to me by the commandment of God our Savior. So Paul is entrusted with the gospel to share the good news, especially to the Gentiles. Verse 4 says, To Titus. So this letter is a personal letter to Titus, a young uh, 
follow of Paul, apprentice as it were. And Paul calls him my true son in our common faith. Paul called a few people his true son. One is Titus and the other one is Timothy. And his usual Pauline greetings, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Saviour. Now we know something about Titus from Paul's letters to different churches. In Galatians, we saw that uh, Titus is the uncircumcised Gentile whom Paul wrote to meet with the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. And even though the, he brought him there, the leaders there did not insist that uh, Titus be circumcised. And this is important. With the issues of the church in Corinth, Paul sent Titus as a troubleshooter, as it were, to try to resolve the misunderstanding between Paul and the church in Corinth. And Paul was eagerly waiting for Titus to bring up, bring back news of what's happening. Finally, Titus met up with Paul and brought the good news that there's breakthrough and the church in Corinth once again wants to reconcile with Paul. And Paul immediately wrote the letter of 2 Corinthians that Titus brought back to the church in Corinth. Also from 2 Corinthians uh, writing, we know that Titus evolved in the collection from the different churches to be brought to the poor in Jerusalem. This is referred to in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, later part. And towards the end of Paul's life in 2 Timothy chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul sent him to Dalmatia. Dalmatia is part of modern-day Yugoslavia, much further north. So we know that uh, Paul uh, found Titus to be a very, very reliable uh, assistant, as it were, and some sort of a troubleshooter. And this letter to Titus, Paul said very clearly what, he, what Titus ought to do. The reason I left you in Crete was that you may straighten out what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town, as I directed you. So what happened is, Paul and uh, Titus went to the island of Crete. When did this happen? We are not very clear. Many people say that Paul was in Rome, first imprisonment. He was set free for about two, three years. And during two, three years, he may have gone with Titus to the island of Crete. And there, they evangelized, shared the gospel, and founded many churches in the different towns in Crete. But for some reason, Paul had to leave, and he left Titus behind to finish the work of setting up these churches in Crete. And one of Paul's uh, instructions to Titus was to appoint leaders in the churches in the different towns in Crete. It may be called elders or may be called overseers, as Pastor Comer referred to in the earlier part when we talked about First Timothy chapter 4, I think. So in verse 6 says, an elder must be blameless, the husband of, of but one wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. So this about the same criteria as we saw, what Paul told uh, Timothy. Okay. Verse 7, since an overseer, overseer and elder about the same, is entrusted with God's work, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to a trustworthy message as he has been taught, so that he may encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. This is about the same thing as what uh, Paul wrote to Timothy, the characteristics or the qualities you want to see in an elder or an overseer for a church. Okay, and the same standard applies to us nowadays. Church leaders need a lot of these qualities as well. It goes on in verse 10 to say, For there are many rebellious people, mere talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision group. So we have 
talk about this whole area of Judaizers, people who says Jesus plus just having faith is just not enough. You must also keep the Jewish laws, the Jewish food laws, circumcision, all that. These are the Judaizers. We heard about them before, okay? And obviously they were present in the island of Crete. Verse 11 says, they must be silenced because they are ruining whole household by teaching things they ought not to teach and that for the sake of dishonest gain. Even one of their own prophets has said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. What a way to describe the people in Crete, but apparently they have this reputation. And uh, so Paul is being very forthright in dealing with the people in Crete, a wise uh, Titus to be very careful. Verse 13, this testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith and will pay no attention to Jewish myth or to the commands of those who reject the truth. So Titus not only had to appoint leaders, but he also had to rebuke the false teachers, the Judaizers, who are here to confuse the people, who are here for dishonest gain. So most probably they were making a living from what they were sharing and trying to teach the, the, the simple early Christians in the different uh, churches in Crete, okay? So Paul says, ask Titus, deal with them very sharply, rebuke them, confront them, and correct their teaching. I think that's important. Verse 15 says, to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. They claim to know God, but by their action, they deny Him. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for doing anything good. That's how Paul sees these false teachers. If in a way you are good insight, then you see things in a different light. But if you are evil, your evil intention, everything else people do will be wrong, will be sinful, will be uh, not good as, as, as they see it. So it is important to us, what's inside will also determine how you view things. My question to you, brothers and sisters, how do you see things? How is your insight today? Is it pure? Is it clean? Is it right? Or is it we are struggling with things within our hearts, sin, corrupt, uh, corrupt things that we have? And because of our insight is not right, we see things outside in a different light. Food for us, food for thought for all of us to think through. Goes on to Paul goes on to tell Titus in chapter 2, you must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love and in endurance. Now, older men is just older men in age, not necessary in faith. Because the churches in the island of Crete most probably were just uh, very... Uh, baby churches as such, founded by Paul and Titus when they came. Or they may have some influence from uh, the Pentecost experience, but there's about 30, 40 years before this. So you want to say older men. It's older men in age, but not necessarily in faith. So it says these people, okay, teach them. They have be self-control. They must earn their respect. They must have their a whole area of faith, they must love and be able to endure whatever comes. Persecution was starting around this time. So will they still stand firm if the persecution comes? If because they are young, new believers. Goes on to say in verse 3, Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderous or addicted to too much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can train the younger women to love their husband and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husband, 
so that no one will malign the word of God. Now, these older women, again in age, women tend to live older than men, even in that time. So if you are, let's say, a widow, your husband had passed away. Women at that time, one was not educated. They tend to be, tend to be only housewife working at home. So we have grown old, you are alone, your husband had passed away. What do you do? Sometimes when women have too much time on their hands, that's why they say slanderous. Slanderous means you tend to talk. The more you talk and you tend to talk bad about others, that's how you slander others. So we need to be careful. Addicted to wine, you have too much time. Those areas in Crete, they produce alcohol, wine. You take to drinking, you drink too much, you become addicted. So what Paul is saying, Titus, is these older women, help them to use their time fruitfully and not to have too much time and go around gossiping here, gossiping there, slander here, slander there. Use their time fruitfully to teach and train younger women to love their husband, to take care of their children, to have self-control, pure, busy in the house, busy taking care of the family, and this is important. This is important, okay? So the whole area of relationship, older women can uh, help to be able to mentor or disciple the younger women and help them along the way. I think this is important and just as applicable for us today as well. If you have time, okay, on your hands, you are retired and all that, use your time fruitfully. Help others, help those in need. Okay, and don't spend your time all the time talking and talking and talking. And because of that, tend to get into a whole area of gossip and slander. I think that's important, a reminder for all of us. <clears throat> Verse 6 says, similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show, show integrity, seriousness and soundness of speech. They cannot be condemned. So that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. I think what uh, Paul is trying to tell Titus is, because Titus is a young man, okay? Encourage the young man to be self-controlled. And the best way to show this is you yourself, because a young man, to show self-control, to show that you do what is good, He's a man of integrity, serious in his faith, serious in his work, serious in his commitment. And his speech is good. His speech is righteous. His speech lifts up people and not tear people down. I think that's important. Okay? So what Paul is trying to tell Titus is, your life is an example for the world to see. So they even they oppose you. They don't like what you are teaching. But they can say nothing bad about you because of the way you live. I think that is important. You notice that I talk about older men, older women, young men, but not about young ladies. Okay? Uh, most probably because they are all homebound and uh, they are all housewife and all that. So uh, Titus, most probably was not married at this time. Okay, so you don't talk about teaching young women. Huh? Okay, just teach young men, older men, older women, okay. So just to avoid any uh, problems. Verse 9 says, Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them. We are, we are talking about relationship between slaves and ma their masters, or currently talk about employees, employers. Okay, if you are a Christian, employee be a good worker be a good worker for the company for your boss verse 10 says not to steal from them but to show that they can be fully trusted so that every way they will make the teaching about god our savior attractive so once a slave become a christian paul tells titus they must be a good slave they must be an obedient slave hard-working slave, honest, 
so that their master will see the change that the Christian faith have in his slaves. That's the best testimony. And the same for today. If you are a Christian employee and your employer is not a Christian, will he see a change or difference between you as a Christian and another employee who is not a Christian? Will you be hardworking? Will you be punctual? Will you be diligent in your work? Will you always say the right thing? Do the right thing and be honest. And it's something for us to think through for those of us who are still working that our faith must be not only talked about but must be seen in action. I think that's important for all of us to remember. Verse 11 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation that appeared to all men, it teaches us to say, no to godly ungodliness and worldly passion and to live self-control upright and godly life in this present age so in many sense this is a summary of the first part that paul wrote to titus you and i need to learn what it means to say no to ungodliness and worldly passion and to live a self-control upright and godly life in the world where we are in among the people that we live in, in the community, in our nation. Do you, do I live up to this standard? Something for us to think through. Verse 13 goes on to say, while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, not only to do what? To redeem us from all wickedness, Okay, to save us from our sin, huh? and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. So here Paul is telling title again the role that Jesus has played to save us from our sin and make us holy people, his people, and we are either eager to do what is good, not to do what is wrong. Do you and I fulfill this criteria? Something for the thing true. Verse 15 says, These then are the things you should teach, encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. So Paul gives a summary in the sense that we, we are all called to say no to ungodliness and worldly passion and to live life that is pleasing to God. At the same time, to remind us that Christ has died for us. Christ has brought us, delivered us from sin, make us a holy people who are eager to do what is right and good. This is our blessed hope. This is a hope that we have as God's children and God's people. Let us pray. Oh Lord, I just thank you, Lord, for the words of Titus, Paul's letter to Titus. Just pray, Lord, that each of us will truly live life that give, in a way, Lord, you glory and honour. Help us, Lord, to be a good Christian in our words, in our deeds, in our life, that others seeing us may see the Christ within us. So help us, help us, Lord, to live a life that truly reflect you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.